Musician. Ara Tepuzian, the renowned Armenian American musician, is back again here on the show, and this time he will be talking about the history of Armenian music in Detroit. Welcome back, Ara. Oh, thank you for having me, Sunita. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here always. Great. <laughs> and first of all, congratulations on receiving the Kresge Artist Fellowship Award. Thank you. How does that feel? You know, it, it still feels uh, almost surreal in, in getting it. Um, it's been a couple years now, and um, when I applied for it, you know, I, I was encouraged uh, by my wife to, uh, you know, you should apply. I really didn't, didn't think that I would win it, to be quite honest. And um, it, it was, as I've said often to people, it was really a game changer. Okay. Yeah, the um, the Kresge Artist Fellow Fellowship is one that you know it's connected to a cash prize. That's the least important part of it, in my opinion. Okay. It's what really happened after that, and the the support um, from the arts community was absolutely fantastic. Not only okay. the Kresge Foundation, ArtServe, um, you know, would would uh, coordinate a lot of these different workshops for us as winners once a month and and just the support that they gave was absolutely outstanding um, they really got um, musicians and writers and artists all to really think a little bit differently about what you do and and how you do it and uh, for me it, it it really changed it, it changed the direction that I wanted to go with music. You know, I was doing... How, how so? Well, I was doing a, a lot of Armenian-related events. And I was still doing a lot of non-Armenian-related type concerts and festivals, but it, it, it showed me that I could really open that range of that second part of it. And so um, thinking a little bit more outside of the normal realm of what an Armenian musician does... Uh, you know, most Armenian American musicians are are playing just the picnics and the weddings and the dances because most of us are doing it part time. It's a labor of love, where I, or per professional. Uh, it's a professional hobby, as different people would say. So it it got me to think about different projects, um, what I could do with the music, how can I present the music differently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that, that it's got to be more, more outwardly. And audiences, um, non-Armenian audiences need to experience it. Um, otherwise, it's going to get lost. Oh, it'll, be lo it'll be lost forever, right? It's like mm -hmm. any kind of ethnic music that yes. mm -hmm. I think we've got sort of a, a job to kind of pass that on and to educate others with it. Correct. And so going through that whole process for me um, really kind of opened my eyes to, wow, I need to do a little bit more of this. And I've got the means to do it and I've got the interest to do it. And, um, and, and so it was for me, it just really kind of changed the direction that I wanted to go with it. So. I, I continue to think that way all the time. How do I do it differently? How do I, how do I present the music, you know, to to a, a, a bigger audience than you know what's typically always been done? You know, it's been really the small, small audience. So that really kind of led into this project of uh, of producing a, a film documentary. So. Oh, great! So tell us all about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well. So uh, a year ago, I had applied for another grant through the uh, Knight Foundation. Okay. Um, and what they did for the first time in Detroit was this uh, Night Arts Challenge. And so they put out to, to, the, you know, to the masses that if you're an artist, you didn't have to be a nonprofit. Um, you could be just an individual applying for this grant. The, it has to have an arts and culture theme to it, and it has to have a Detroit theme to it. 
And so backing up a step, when I part of what I got when I received the, the Kresge Fellowship was the ability to present at a, um, a program called ArtX Detroit, which, um, which was, about, uh, was about a year ago at this point. And the theme of what I wanted to do, I mean, they, they took care of you know, funding it and, and putting it all together, was I wanted to present, I wanted to bring musician friends of mine in, I wanted to bring really high caliber artists, and I did. Um, a clarinet player, uh, an oud player, which is like a Middle Eastern lute, and then a, a Middle Eastern percussionist. Now, these are all uh, from in the U.S. or yeah, they're okay. from the U.S. Um, uh, two of them were from Boston, and one here locally. So, four of us played on stage. I wanted it to be a little bit reminiscent of the music, um, you know, without a guitar or, or a keyboard, or any kind of electronic sounding instruments. Um, I wanted that to be sort of reminiscent of what it used to be like. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the presentation was really sort of to pay a little bit of homage to a lot of these Armenian musicians that um, played in Detroit back in the, you know, in the 20s through the, through the 60s. So after I did that concert, I said, wow. You know, and I did a lecture before that. And I got to thinking, boy, I'd really like to put this into some sort of a film. I, I had always wanted um, to do a like a coffee table book on old pictures of Armenian musicians from around the country. This was something I wanted to do a long time ago. That's a monumental project, one that you know I'd have to devote too much time to. But doing a documentary like this, where I'm focused on um, Detroit and Armenian music and the musicians, I thought, hmm, I'm gonna apply for this grant. It's a challenge grant, which meant that if I got it, I had to raise the equal amount of money in order to get the actual grant. Okay. And I said, I'd love to do a film like this. And um, they, they loved the idea. I was one of, I believe, 50 other winners from that. Wow. Um, and so that really started, that, that made it real for me. You know, that, um, that made it real for me to, I'm going to do this, I can, I can get this done. And so um, once I received that, it was, um, it was a, uh, uh, a grant that I had one year to raise the funds. And it took me about one month to raise it. Yeah, amazing. it was um, it was really amazing. Um, the uh, support behind it, from both the Armenian and non-Armenian community was fantastic. I, I wanted to be very careful about raising funds because there are so many charitable organizations and right. Armenian charitable organizations, I really didn't want to take away from that. So I really didn't make this you know, sales pitch, knock on the door kind of thing and, and say, hey, you know, would you like mm -hmm. to donate? There were people really that came and said, Paul, this is something that's great. We'd like to give you some money for it. I did a um, Kickstarter program for it, and it just went through the roof. Great. So funding was secured, and um, I'm in the sort of script phase, which we shared a little bit off camera. It's, you know, a little bit of a challenge for me. Mm -hmm. It's not my forte to write a script, but I'm doing so really to gather a lot of the thoughts and, and okay. the process that I want to do with it. So the film itself... Uh, really goes back to the um, after the Armenian genocide, and we can talk about that too a little bit, through, let's say, the, the mid to, to late 60s. And what I'm focusing on are the musicians that brought this music, our folk music, our village music, from the old country to Detroit. They didn't just bring it to Detroit. I mean, when, when Armenians dispersed and and went throughout the diaspora, I mean, they took music to where they obviously landed. But in Detroit, Detroit, prior to the Armenian Genocide, was probably about 3,000 Armenians lived in Detroit. We were probably here, oh, the mid-1800s, we started to come to Detroit. I, I remember reading it somewhere that um, a couple, like, silk, Merchants. They were the first ones yeah. to land here. Is that yeah. right? Well, they, they brought a lot mm -hmm. of different 
um, trades with them. I mean, um, you know, we we were very we were wealthy people prior to the genocide, mm -hmm. you know, and so the Armenians that that lived in you know we we would call it call it old Armenia, but we lived in the different villages in Turkey, and so maybe that's a good segue to even just say that you know what had happened in um, the beginning of. Uh, April 24th, 1915, and next year is the 100th anniversary of, of the oh. genocide, a million and a half Armenians were massacred by order of the oh. Turkish government. Um, they rounded up initially, and beginning on, on April 24th, they, they rounded up the intellects, the business, uh, the artists, the doctors, you know, all the smart people really in the community. They, they gathered them up, they murdered them, and then they went to the families. And they did, um, you know, very similar to the, the Jewish Holocaust. I mean, it's, it's, as a matter of fact, Hitler quoted the Armenian genocide, you know, right before he invaded Poland. Um, but a million and a half were, were led on death marches, killed, and, you know, just a very gruesome, horrible um, time for the Armenians. They didn't all perish, obviously. They, they escaped, a number of them escaped. Um, and, and again, there were Armenians that had left prior to that, so I mean, that's why we're you know, here today. But every Armenian, pretty much every Armenian has been affected one way or another you know, with the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. For me, it would be you know, great-grandparents and, and great-great-uncles and, and aunts and so forth that were affected by that. But, but if, it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing that music survives all these, right? Absolutely. Well, think about it. You yeah. know, when you when you talk about what the music was like mm -hmm. back in the villages, I mean, these were simplistic folk songs mm -hmm. for the most part. They talked about village life. If, if it was about a pretty girl or the type yeah. of food mm -hmm. or or what what the um, the landscape was, these were the the origins of a lot of our our village music. And so you had musicians that that uh, existed that played our music and played on these uh, uh, ethnic instruments and and people had a real good time and then certainly as they left and and emigrated uh, to other countries the United States was one of the largest ones they came to California they came to New York um, Massachusetts um, Michigan those were probably the main areas okay um, we didn't have tape recorders. We didn't have I record know. players. We had to rely on those musicians or the folk people, just you know, people that knew the music mm -hmm. that were, it was in their head. They brought it to this country. If, if not for them, it would have all been lost. We've lost a number of it anyway. Um, we've lost um, a lot of the, the lyrics. Um, I remember a musician telling me that every single Armenian song had lyrics to it, all of it, yeah. and just you know passing it on to generation to generation, it, it gets lost. So, you know, we've 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 lost. I can't even imagine what we've probably lost, knowing the thousands of different songs that you know that we know today and and still have. So those musicians came to this country with the songs in their head, and um, when they were playing it. Um, at, at house parties, that, and that's how it all sort of kind of progressed. It was music at people's homes or outdoor gatherings or weddings or baptisms. Mm -hmm. it, it really started there. So you had those, you know, I really call them master musicians that now taught these younger kids at the time who would be, for my generation, those are the master musicians. Yeah, yeah. They would sit like us and uh, they, would, they would hum the song to the student, and the student would play, because normally the, 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 um, the master that's telling this mm -hmm. music was too old and didn't right. play their instrument mm -hmm. anymore. And then that student, that kid had to go home with that song, repeating it in their head, and go home and practice and practice. There was no, no way to write it down. They right. weren't writing notes. There was, again, no digital recorders yeah. you know, mm -hmm. doing any of that. So it survived. Um, and it, it really started to grow from there. Now, when um, the musicians landed here, I mean, after that, did the music change in any way, or has it retained the same folk tradition? 
I think for the most part, it is, it's re retained its tradition. Um, its style, um, I think there were some nuances that changed you know, throughout, uh, throughout those decades from once they came here. Things like um, you know, the guitar was added in the 60s, and the guitar was added because of rock and roll. Um, it was a good addition. It was an American, uh, really, addition to it. Um, that changed a bit the sound, you know, gave it a little bit of more of that driving force. Um, in the 40s, there were a couple of Armenian bands um, out east that were sort of that big band sound. Well, that's obviously from, you know, the Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman jazz era, mm -hmm. where they had these big bands. So we had a few of those as well. So it, it, it changed a little bit. Um, the music itself really hasn't. Um, there may be some different nuances and, and styles have changed, but uh, if you go back and listen to old 78 RPM records, it's, it's really the same. I mean, the, the, the notes, the, the scales that were used, I mean, that's, that hasn't changed. We're using modes that um, have existed, uh, you know, for almost centuries, centuries going back. So, um, what you saw, though, was you saw, uh, you, you saw more of the music popping up. And that's part of this documentary, is really to talk about those Armenian musicians that, that really started to play this music. What was it like? You know, they were playing at, um, again, churches, dances, picnics. And then it progressed from there into the nightclubs. And, and let's talk about some of those nightclubs, you know. And, and they, don't, they don't exist today. The Armenians, when they came to Detroit, lived in really the, the Delray Highland Park area of Detroit, which is really more now Mexican town and near the Ambassador Bridge. And they, they landed there predominantly because of Ford Motor. Okay. Um, Henry Ford had instituted the $5 workday. You know, that was not in existence uh, prior uh, to him. And so you had Armenians that said, okay, well, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to Michigan because of the car companies. Uh, I'm gonna go specifically to Detroit because of Henry Ford. Uh, and I'm gonna live in these areas because it's what, they didn't have cars, so it was walking distance or, mm -hmm. or taking the bus. So they created a community for themselves there. Um, and it progressed from, from time, you know, more, more families were growing up there, so then Armenians were getting back into their own businesses. They had restaurants, they had bakeries, they had dry cleaners, there were a lot of dry cleaners in the day, tailors, mm -hmm. um, and grocery store merchants and every, everything else. And they, they established uh, a home. I had a musician tell me once, there's a street, still exists in, in that area called Salve Street. Mm -hmm. And at one point when the bus would pull up to Salve Street, instead of just saying, you know, you know over the loudspeaker, Salve Street, you know, he would yell, Armenian Boulevard. So you had okay. tons of Armenians. You know, so is, is, there, is there a very big population here in uh, Michigan? In Michigan, there's probably about you know, 30, 40,000 people. Okay. Um, I don't have any concrete data to show that it's more or less. Uh, it may be a little bit less. I think we've dispersed a bit. And, um, but I, I think we're in that probably in that 30,000 range. And we've been like that for several decades. Um, predominantly down here in the uh, in the Detroit area. Okay. Now, what's the language spoken in Armenia? Or Armenian. Armenian. <laughs> yeah. It's called Armenian. It is called Armenian. So Armenia exists today. It's the um, you know prior to 1991, it was Soviet Armenia. So, um, but but my family and and a lot of the Armenians. A lot of the American Armenians, American-born Armenians, really came from Turkey. So I, it's okay. sometimes when, when people ask, you know, where are you from? Uh, and I, after I say, well, I was born here, I have to kind of give them a little bit of history because if I say, well, my family was from Turkey, they don't really kind of understand that. So my family, and I don't have family in Armenia today. There is a country, Armenia. Um, obviously, it borders Turkey, um, but that's not, you know, that was sort of, um, that was Soviet ruled, you know, at one point. But my family really came from the villages 
of uh, within Turkey, within okay. the interior uh, of Turkey, so sort in, of south your, of Istanbul. In your family, who was the first one to come here? Was in my family? family, it would have been my grandparents. Okay. Um, on my mother's side, she actually was not born in Turkey. She was born in, in Hungary. But my grandfather, who came from a very large family, um, was from Turkey. On my father's side, um, um, my grandparents were from Turkey. My grandmother and, and her brother escaped the genocide. Her future um, husband was already here, so he was not affected by it. Um, so it really goes back to what I said earlier, that it's, it was sort of my great, great, you know, grandparents that were affected by that. But my grandparents were the ones that sort of emigrated to the United States. Okay. My um, father's side was from upstate New York, and my mother's side was here in Detroit uh, that grew up. And now, which side had way. the music? Nobody. Really? <laughs> yeah, nobody. I get that question a lot, you know, where, you know, who... Who taught you this, or where, you know, who who played music in your family? Because it must be something. Th there wasn't anyone. I grew up listening to music. I um, I just think it was always in me that you know. And I go back now and I think about the kind of music that I'd listen to, and I'd listen to classical music. And you know, my mother was blaring. You know, back back in the seventies, the houses all had those sort of internal radio uh, intercom systems, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember coming home from school, walking up the driveway, windows are open, she's blaring jazz, <laughs> she's blaring Sinatra and everything else out those windows. And so I always heard music in the house. But I, I sometimes gravitated toward classical music that had a bit of that, either the, the, the Middle Eastern, Armenian, European sounds to it. Mm -hmm. I, I now go back and say, wow, I, I remember growing up and really liking that. And I really think I Sorry enjoyed a lot of that. You. So your, your parents never listened to Armenian music? They listened to it, but none of them were musicians. Okay. No. So we had it in the house. I mean, we had records in the house. Okay. Um, my, um, my oldest brother liked music. Um, I mean, he played a little bit um, for his sort of own enjoyment, but it was... It was more of just really listening to these records and then kind of growing up and going to the different dances and, uh, you know, that started it. it. It really, you know, I've got a very good friend of mine who is a musician and I used to babysit for his children and we lived maybe about five minutes away. But when he would take me home after babysitting, it was like a 20 minute drive because he was going very slow. That was his downtime. And so he was going very slow on the way home, he had a little cigar lit, but he was playing a lot of this music that I had never heard. And I really, really was getting into it. I was really listening to it. And, and I really kind of gravitated from listening to American music and classical, Western classical music to the Middle Eastern music. I just loved it. I loved watching it. Um, I, wa I loved watching musicians take these solos that just, you know, would, would get you all excited. I mean, we're all groupies. I mean, we wanted mm -hmm. to go and, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of the music that we play is very upbeat. It's not all upbeat, but a lot of it is. Um, we use the word kef, K-E-F, mm -hmm. which is a Middle Eastern term for party. Okay. So we would go to these kefs, basically. The Greeks use this word too a mm -hmm. little bit. And uh, we'd go to these kefs and we'd listen to these musicians. And a lot of them were musicians that came in from out of town that we wouldn't always see. So, oh, so-and-so is coming, we gotta go to that event, we gotta go see these musicians. It really went, for me, it went from there for a long time to, it wasn't until really after college when I said, um, I think I wanna do this. I wanna I want to be on stage too uh, and play this music. Now, uh, the kanun that you play, yes, it's a stringed instrument. It's it is. It's very a very intricate yeah. uh, instrument, correct? Yeah, it's a 76 stringed, laptop harp, trapezoid shape. Um, it dates back, they say, to the fifth century. Um, it's the grandfather of the piano for sure. Um, it's played throughout Armenia. It's played throughout the Middle East, all the, the, the um, um, uh, you know, Greek, Mediterranean, 
uh, it's played in Israel. I mean, everybody has uh, got a little bit of a version of it. it. It's it's it looks the same for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's plucked. No, um, that's also like the dulcimer, is is it? No? Same family. I, you know, I get a lot of people that say, "Oh, it's a it's a zither or a dulcimer or a symbolum," and they're all in that same family. But this is plucked. You've got picks on your index fingers and and. You're, you're plucking strings. And you started playing this instrument after went, college. After college. Yeah. With no background whatsoever None. in the I, family. I wanted to, I had an opportunity to play with a local Armenian band, and I was playing a tambourine. Okay. okay? <laughs> and um, uh, I, it, was, it was to that point where I said, boy, I really like to play a melodic instrument because I wanted to play the actual songs. I wanted to to take these solos. I, I wanted to have fun with it. And how, how long did it take uh, you to even get the hang of it? Um, it took a while. It's not the easiest. No, it's, it's not, not the most complicated no. either. Um, I think you've got to have an ear for it. And if you have an ear for it, I had a musician once tell me that if you can whistle the song, you can play the song. So it really was from, um, you know, that that point of just really learning it. Um, I didn't have a teacher. I didn't have a proper teacher. I would have different musicians show me different things through the years and you know I'm still learning. You know that's how I look Great. at it. Now coming back to your project. Yeah. Um, what are the plans? Well the plans are to, um, to, to interview um, Armenian uh, musicians that are still alive that, that played during that era uh, or relatives or old nightclub owners, even um, I'd like to interview different Arabic or Greek musicians because we played not just with Armenians but with a lot of different other eth ethnic groups. So the, the goal is in 2014 to film uh, and have this all completed with the possibility of getting it on to PBS, that's the goal, uh, for next year. Okay. In commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. So it's a big project. Um, it's an exciting one for me. I had a musician's son call me the other day from California, 75-year-old man who said, my daughter saw you must have had a picture of my dad on the Internet, and I've got all this information and, and stuff wow. to share. Okay. And, and we don't have that. So I'm in the gathering phase, too, Great. which is very exciting. Photos, memorabilia, old videos, and, and um, we're going to put it all together and, and uh, put this documentary out for next year. Great. I wish you good luck with that. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for watching the show. And thanks to Ara again. And uh, we hope uh, he finds success in this project. And thanks again for watching The World Musician. This is Sunita bringing the world together with music.